And welcome in Lake Kick is live. It is Thursday night, May 26th, the year of our Lord, 2022. Wisdom tonight from the unlikeliest of places in the college football universe. We are jam-packed high atop a beautiful downtown Nashville, Tennessee. This evening, dare I read quotations from one Ole Miss head coach, Lane Kiffin, and say, listen to that guy. Yes, yes, I do dare, because we are at that kind of point in this sport right now. Bold predictions, version 11 on tap tonight. We are also going to do some things on the transfer portal in a sort of a finality, totality approach because we've got final player rankings, we've got team rankings, and I've got a lot of things to say. Now that the dust has started to settle on the transfer portal, do you have any idea how much that thing just shaped every conference championship race this year? Some of you may. I'm going to emphatically tell you, if you don't, how much it shaped the entire landscape of the sport this year. Have you ever used the term recruiting bust? Because one of you asked me a question about why so many kids bust in recruiting. Why are so many five-star players busts? And we just see this from such a different angle. I think some of you and I, not all of you, certainly the person who asked the question. So I will dive into that. And it's time because we have so many new faces around here. We have so many new people in the audience. It's time to revisit just a mere 200 days ago what happened between us and the folks over at College Game Day. We got banned. We got banned from College Game Day. I have no ill will or animosity, but the story does deserve to be retold. They are watching us and listening to us in Pueblo, Colorado, Louisville, Kentucky, Richmond, Virginia, and Huntsville, Texas, and I assume Alabama. But we need to go to Huntsville, Texas to say an early congratulations to Nathan and Leanne. They're getting married, and that's great news, but the really great news is check your calendars, people. It's May. It's it's spring. It's summer. You know how much we're into spring and summer weddings around here. What does it do? Well, number one, it forms a holy union between a man and a woman. But number two, it frees up a Saturday in the fall that otherwise would have been filled with all that nonsense. So thank you and congratulations to Nathan and Leanne. And that's not all. If you want to hop on the spring and summer wedding train, how about Scott and Kenley? Because they just tied the knot this past weekend and Scott was nice enough to reach out because some of his buddies booked a cameo from me as one of his groomsman's gift. What a groomsman gift, by the way. And he said, and I quote, I got to read it here because the text is too small. Uh, he said, hey, I just wanted to let you know we partied hard outside of Southwest Florida this past weekend, nearly 100 degree heat and humidity, all to avoid the most cardinal sin. I hope everyone's paying attention to avoid the most cardinal sin of hosting a fall Saturday wedding. I don't call it off season. I call it wedding season. We even had a surprise guest show up, the Clemson Tiger. And if you're listening on podcast, he ain't lying. There's a picture of him, Kenley, the, the newlywed couple there, and the Clemson Tiger. I don't know how free his Saturday was that he got over to the wedding, but congratulations to anyone who is getting married this time of year. And um, just something to think about if you're planning on getting married in the other time of year, our time of year. Let's get into the show tonight. Boy, we got a lot to talk about. I don't know that I have ever had an open to a show where I plan to talk so much about words coming out of Lane Kiffin's mouth in sort of a prophetic tone. We've talked about Lane Kiffin a lot, but it's never in a, well, that's a good point sort of tone. So let's dive into this. There are many benefits to having Lane Kiffin in college football. One of them is you're never short on quotes. Anytime something happens, i.e. Jimbo Fisher and Lane, or Nick Saban going at each other, you're sure to have him tell you what he thinks. And he did that. And then with Ross Dellinger over at Sports Illustrated, he really went in depth. And that piece got released yesterday over on SI.com. Some of you have already read it, but I had so many of you, dozens, maybe hundreds, reached out and said, what do you think about this? So I figured we'd lead the show with it tonight. And I'm going to show you, if you haven't already read this, I'm going to show you three different, very noteworthy quotes that came from Lane Kiffin in this Ross Dellinger piece over on SI.com. And the first one has to do with free agency in college football, because that's what a lot of people have referred to NIL as. And to be clear, what he's talking about here in this wide-ranging interview is the state of college football right now. And Kiffin had a lot to say, as he usually does, but man, I'm telling you, this is different than normal. Like, Kiffin's saying a lot of stuff that I think some folks are scared to speak out about, and he's just never been that way. He really doesn't have much of a filter on him. So, Colin, throw up this first quote about free agency, and I'm going to pull it up over here. Listen to this. If you're, if you're riding around and you're listening on podcast, if you're watching on YouTube, listen to this. This is Lane Kiffin speaking about NIL and the transfer portal. We're a professional sport, and they are professional players. Contracted employees, but without contracts. They can get out whenever they want. 
How is it not being seen that unless there are changes of rules around caps and contracts, how is every elite college player not at the end of their season entering the transfer portal? This is something that is feared and didn't quite come to fruition this past cycle like many thought it would. I know you saw a lot of kids enter the transfer portal, but believe me, behind the scenes, there was a worry that like half of everyone's roster was going to enter the transfer portal. Why is that? Well, Lane Kiffin's telling you right now. The, the reason a lot of people look at this as unsustainable, although those are not his words, but they are people like my words, it's unsustainable because you have some of the elements of free agency that exist in the NFL. You have the ability to go test the market, but you don't have any parameters in place. What Lane Kiffin said, he kind of went on to mention Bryce Young. He said, I can't believe Bryce Young did not enter the transfer portal, even if he had no intention of leaving Alabama. There's nothing on that scholarship piece of paper that he signed with Alabama that limits him from doing it. And now you've got this market where you can put your name out there and just see what the highest bidder has to say. Like, I, I've been in contract renegotiation phase for about six months now. You just, you're in a market where you see what people say. But see, unlike college football players, I'm locked into CBS for a certain amount of time. And then I've got a negotiation window. And then whoever I sign with, then I've got X number of years that I can't talk to anybody else for. It's the same way in the pros, no matter if it's baseball, football, basketball. But in college right now, that is not the case. And so Lane Kiffin made a very good point that I think a lot of folks are only just now realizing because it's so new. Every, everything about this is new. I would venture to guess several high-profile college football players, if they were to read that, would think to themselves, wow, that's a good point, which means they didn't even understand immediately that's possible, but it is possible. And like he said, like Lane Kiffin said, if nothing changes, that will be the norm, which is why, stands to reason, there's a lot of grinding of teeth right now in different conference sectors because something has to change because that's obviously untenable. I know a lot of people have entered the room, stressed the word entered the room recently, which means they weren't always here. They are not college football diehards. They don't eat, sleep, and breathe it. They're just passers-by, kind of like the locusts. And once they get rid of this field and everything good about it, then they'll move on to the next field. But a lot of people have come in the room lately and they've told you, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just the way it's, it's the way it's going to work. It's the way it should work. No, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's not the way it should work. That's coming from a vantage point of someone that has 14 different agendas and ulterior motives, none of which are the best interest of college football. So everyone's entitled to their opinion, as I've said many times on the show. I just don't have to respect all the opinions. I don't respect the opinion, on this topic at least, of anyone who says, Oh, free agency every year, kids entering the portal every year. That should be normal. That's just the way it should work. No, it's not. No, it's not. So we move on. Lane Kiffin also talked about the locker room. He's not alone here. I've had several of you message me about this, but he went a step further, did Lane Kiffin, talking not only about the locker room, but also about how players are being bought in the NIL market. This from Lane Kiffin. He said, there are all kinds of issues coming. Let's say reports are true. Some high school quarterback is making six to eight mil. How's that going to work? How is he coming into that locker room? Are coaches going to need to play him? This is where it gets real. Listen to this. Are coaches going to need to play him or are donors going to be mad when he's not playing? The first round pick, the donor drafts. I've been in that situation. He's talking about coaching in Oakland when they drafted Jamarcus Russell and Jamarcus Russell wasn't ready to play, but Al Davis, the GM's telling him, I drafted that guy number one overall. You know how much money I'm paying him? You better play him. Well, Lane Kiffin's talking about that existing in the college world now. He continues, the people paying that kind of money are going to want that guy to play. If he's not playing, how's the backup quarterback who's just earning a scholarship going to play over him? Do you think this will happen? I do. Not all over the place. I think it'll be case by case. I, I think you've got to get a whole lot more nuanced on this conversation. This could exist at Oklahoma one year. It could happen at Virginia Tech one year, whereas at Illinois, it may not happen, or at uh, USC, a given year, it may not happen. I'm mentioning those programs generically. The more specific point here is, this will happen. The locker room issues not worried me so much. I've not been focused on that, because my philosophy on that has been, that's not going to break up a locker room that wasn't already prone to being broken up before. Because before the NIL era, if you've ever been in a locker room, if you've been around this sport, if you've watched this sport for a long time, you could probably recall teams that underachieved, 
And after the season's over and all the stories get told, you find out they just had a bad locker room dynamic. Well, how did it happen before NIL? The answer is poor culture. Uh, you had a few bad apples in the bushel and they spoiled the whole barrel. You can go back to the Aesop's fables world and you can know what wrecks a college football locker room. The point is, I've always been of the opinion that if you got stable culture there, if you got good culture, this probably won't wreck it nearly as quickly as if you got bad culture. Now, if you got bad culture, this will wreck it quicker than it would in the past, but it was already going to be wrecked anyway. So I'm not worried about that as much, but the second part of what Kiffin said there, oh, that's a huge problem. And it's, it's going to happen. That's an inevitability. Think about forking over the kinds of money you have to participate in these collectives and whatnot. And knowing that that money went to get a five-star defensive end, that all the recruiting services had rated that. And so in your mind, he's the number one player at his position in the country. He comes in, okay, he's a special teams contributor the first half of his freshman season. But man, after we get out of the bye week and we're in the home stretch there in November and he's still not starting, what did I pay for? So who am I getting mad at? Not the kid, not the recruiting service. I'm getting mad at the coach. And uh, that cannot happen. For 10 obvious reasons, that cannot happen. But yet, Lane Kiffin suggests, and I agree, that it will happen. Part two, why this is very unsustainable. And part two of why when anyone walks in the door and says, oh, that's, that's going to be normal and that's okay. Don't listen to them. Th those are casuals. And what do we do with casuals? We reach over to the volume knob, we turn it down to zero, and then we smile at them and wave at them. And you just see an, a moving mouth, but there's no actual words coming out that you can hear. Uh, that's, that's the best way to deal with casuals in and out of college football. Lane Kiffin continues. Let's talk about some money here, shall we? Lane Kiffin said, this is talking about recruiting specifically, I could have worked my butt off for three years. You could have done three minutes. There was a player who went to a school that we got beat on. I asked him about the relationship with the head coach. He had never talked to him, NIL. Lane Kiffin's talking about something that's interested me, but I have not spoken about on the show quite yet. And that's the concept that there could be really, really good recruiting jobs being done, but it doesn't matter because money will always win out. A lot of people have gotten mad at kids about this. You don't need to be getting mad at kids about it. They're not doing anything different than you would, whether you're 18 years old or 48 years old. If you've got an opportunity here, and then someone offers you four times the amount you would make here over there, where are you going? I know where most of you are going. You're probably going the same place I would go. Doubly, especially if I were 18 years old. I can't get mad at kids for making that decision. Every one of us in that position will make that decision. Lane Kiffin's not demonizing kids here, quite the opposite. He said, we shouldn't be getting mad at the kids. It's the adults that kick the can down the road. The kids weren't born yet. The kids we're talking about right now were not even born yet when the decisions should have been being made that would have maybe avoided us winding up where we are right now. But we are here. And so from this point moving forward, what do you have? Possible solutions? Maybe. I'll talk about it in a second. But what Lane Kiffin's talking about here is money will always win out. That kind of brings me to a, another part of why this has to be solved or something has to happen. Th that, that is a theme that is woven throughout every quote I just read you. But now how about some unanswerable questions? I'm just going to throw some of them at you. Uh, by the very definition of an unanswerable question, I don't have these answers. But think about putting together a coaching staff in the future. Lane Kiffin said, hey, if you're a head coach in the future, all you're going to ask about with a school is what does your NIL structure look like? because that will be the most important thing when it comes to winning, unless something changes. Well, I'm thinking about head coaches hiring assistant coaches. What do you value? Because right now you value recruiting. In fact, you cut corners sometimes on a guy's ability in the X's and O's department just because you know he can acquire talent. He's a good recruiter. Uh, there are very, very notable examples in college football of super recruiters that are, eh, whatever, on game day, but what they bring you on the trail more than makes up for what they may lack on the grease board. Is that the same moving forward? If this really becomes an NIL game, if it just becomes a transactional game, what value is there for the super recruiter, for the A-level recruiter who is a C-level coach? Is there still a place for that guy in the game? And does it change the way that you construct your staff? And could also this open the door for more high school coaches? Because I can promise you this, here's a dirty little secret. There are some guys holding down jobs, making six figures on your college staff that probably would have circles drawn around them on said grease board by some of the bigger high school staffs and people on those high school staffs in your hometown. 
The difference is, for whatever reason, maybe it's the agent that represents them, or maybe it's the way they carry themselves on the recruiting trail, or maybe it's just they've got more experience, that coach on the college staff can acquire talent. Whereas this coach at the high school level, now oh, he's just he's just got chalk all over his hands. He's just a grinder, man. I don't want him out on the recruiting trail. Well, if that doesn't matter so much anymore, you got a lot of guys at the high school level that would get calls tomorrow. If recruiting wasn't a huge factor in the game anymore, you got a bunch of high school coaches that would have college jobs, boom, just like that. Just think about that. That's an unanswerable question because I don't know if this structure is going to stay this way forever. Therefore, I don't know if any long-term permanent changes in the direction of the sport are going to occur. How aggressive are conferences going to be? And this is going to start to be answered, I think, next week down in Destin when the SEC has their spring meetings. This is the biggest question right now. I've spoken about this for the last two shows. You've got this Hail Mary approach out there of let's get Congress involved. I've told you I've changed my thinking on that. I don't think that's the way it's going to go. And so the follow-up is, well, if the NCAA can't do it for threat of lawsuit and a 9-0 SCOTUS decision against them, let's take it upon ourselves to police things at the college level. I expect the SEC to be pretty bold on this, and that's why I almost wish this Lane Kiffin interview would have come two weeks after it did. I'd love to get these guys on the record after their spring meetings. Because one way or the other, this is going to be addressed very poignantly in those spring meetings down in Destin next week. What do they walk away thinking then? That's what I'd love to know. Unknowable at the moment. Here's one that's just totally off the wall. Right now, if you think about a career in football, if you think about making big money in football right now, you think, I've got to make it to the NFL. If you're five years old right now, or if you're the parents of a five-year-old kid right now, and you're thinking about which sport to sign him up for, boy, it's such a long shot to ever get anything financially in the sport of football unless you make it to the NFL, right? Yeah, that's the way it's always been. Youth football participation rates have declined, not because of that, but because of the injury and you can go play soccer, there's so many more safer options. I wonder what this will do for youth football participation. This could be a plus, could be a hidden plus of NIL. If all of a sudden, and especially if all of a sudden some of these conferences start giving a small sliver of that multimedia distribution rights pie to players, all of a sudden you don't have to make it to the NFL anymore to make really good money playing football. You can make it as an 18 year old playing for the University of Missouri. You, you could make it playing for Purdue. I almost wonder if someone's on the fence about letting kids play football or if someone's on the fence when they're a freshman in high school, do I want to go just stick to baseball or do I want to stick it out with football? I almost wonder if that's in the back of kids' minds. It's unknowable. I don't know. We're too early in it. And also, how much correction is going to occur? You know the crowd over here? I keep pointing to them. It's the crowd that comes in the door because they weren't here already and they talk about how, oh, all your fears, they're unfounded. You're scared of things just because it's unknown, but don't worry, the market will correct itself. How many times have you heard that? I say it all the time in economics. I don't say it all that often in college football, normally because it doesn't apply. But I also don't know that it applies here quite yet, or at least I'm not as confident in that because I don't think we have true market forces at work here the way we would just in an open economic free market. I think that there's a lot that's artificial about this market in particular. And because of that, I don't know how quickly it corrects. When people tell you, to be clear, what I'm talking about here, when people say it'll correct, they're normally talking to someone who's freaking out and saying NIL is going to ruin college football. Uh, these folks won't be able to compete against those folks, yada, yada, yada. And they'll tell you, oh, don't worry. Those numbers won't be that astronomical forever because uh, some boosters are going to spend big money on players. They'll get burned when they don't pan out. And then the market will correct and it'll level off the way that a typical market would work. Lane Kiffin talked about that. He said, I don't think that's the case at all. I don't know that I don't agree with him. I think that was like a triple-double negative, but I'm not so sure Lane Kiffin's not probably onto something there. I think there are a lot of artificial forces already in this market, meaning I think there are a lot of price tags being attached to certain players that if this were a true market would not represent what that player is actually worth. I think that a lot of these donors and boosters couldn't even care less what the player's name is. They just know that's an asset that team needs. And in some ways, well, that is how a market works. In other ways, that's not leveling off. I don't think that outside of maybe a few programs that's leveling off because what Lane Kiffin said, and we'll wrap it up here, what Lane Kiffin said that's true is you've got some donor classes out there that are on the hook for paying $40 million to pay coaching staffs not to coach for them. 
What do you think 20 million per class is? That's actually to get players to come play here. They're willing to chuck out all that money to pay staffs to go away, to buy them out before they pay a new staff. And he's right about that. And so I don't know, absent conferences getting aggressive about this, what will change or what can change. And that's why that's the million dollar or maybe even billion dollar question. What are conferences going to do to get aggressive about this? You will hear a lot more about that probably around this time next week. One of the best DMs or emails that I can open these days is one like I got yesterday, I think it was. I opened the DM and it was a picture of an Academy Sports and Outdoors receipt. Those are always good. I get those by the hundreds every week. Those are great. Keep them coming. But here is the cherry on top. The cherry on top is the Academy Sports and Outdoors receipt. It could be a grill, could be a pair of shoes. But then it says, you know, shame on me. I went to the other store before I went to Academy today. And I don't know why, but they didn't have what I wanted. And sure enough, I went to Academy and they had exactly what I wanted. And you know what? Tracy Lawrence, probably one of the most underrated country artists ever, had a song and it was called Lessons Learned. And they sure run deep. They don't go away and they don't come cheap. There's no way around it as this world turns, lessons learned. Well, that's a lesson that I think we all need to learn about Academy Sports and Outdoors. You can go wherever you want to, but eventually you're coming back to Academy because they're always going to have what you need, especially in terms of outdoor sporting goods supplies. But in a lot of cases, you guys are finding out they got what you need, extending far beyond just the uh, typical boundaries of sporting goods. But boy, do they have sporting goods. You know, producer Jesse and I, in an alternate universe where he exists, have a big doubleheader tomorrow night. I mean, big doubleheader in softball. So we will be equipped head to toe with gear from Academy. I, don't, I wouldn't call us sponsored players from Academy, but it feels that way. Um, whatever you need, Academy Sports and Outdoors has your back, and they have our back. And so in order to have our back as a show, which you're a part of, it just makes sense. It just makes sense to go to Academy Sports and Outdoors. And if you can't get there in person, that's fine. No one cares. Academy.com has all your needs taken care of, and we appreciate them. I can't believe we've made it 11 chapters on this, but we have. And also, you know what? This is aggravating me. So I'm going straighten my microphone out there. Um, let's get into 11.0, bold predictions. Bold predictions version 11 tonight. We've got five more. This has been one of the most fun segments we've ever done continuously. Uh, this first one, there's, there's a lot of boldness top to bottom here tonight. But this first one, I just don't know. But let's take a look at it, you and I together. Texas embarrasses Alabama in week two. This is our first bold prediction from one of you. The rules are here are simple. Make a bold prediction you would bet your own money on. What do we define as embarrassed? Well, we have figured that has to mean 14 points or more. So Alabama is going to lose to Texas in week two by 14 or more. Keep in mind, Alabama is favored by over 14 in the game. It's in Austin. Texas got that going for them. How rare would this be? Well, Stats and Info, a.k.a. Producer Jesse, look this up today. 14 point or more loss for Alabama in the regular season. How many times do you think that's happened since 07? So Saban's second year, 08, through present day. You know how many games they've lost by 14 or more points during the regular season? Uno. And it happened 12 years ago in Columbia, South Carolina. That's why when you walk the streets of Tuscaloosa and you say the name Steven Garcia, they give you a citation. I think it's against an actual city ordinance to even say the name Steven Garcia in Tuscaloosa to this day. They've lost a couple of the New Year's Six games by 14. Uh, they lost to Georgia by 15 this past January. That just doesn't even process in my mind as a two touchdown win because it, it was a pick six at the very end, but hey, that counts. So the 2018 Clemson game, that national championship game. That's the only time I've really seen them embarrassed recently. Is that going to happen at Texas? I don't think so. That's why I put it at a 9.99 on the boldness scale. Texas could win the game. That wouldn't be the most wild thing to ever see. We're talking about embarrassing Bama, though. So they got to run it up on them. Do you know how hard it is to do that period? I think you do because I just showed you. But secondly, the University of Texas doing it. How are they going to run away from Bama? Having the offensive line situation that Texas has, uh, having a brand new quarterback to break in, how are they running away from Bama? It's one thing to beat them. Beating them by 14 plus, I have no clue how that happens. 
And so I'm giving this a 9.99. That's as close to a 10 on the boldness scale as it gets. Let's move to Michigan here because this one's pretty bold too. I gave this one an 8. Bold prediction. Michigan wins eight games or less this season, and Harbaugh's back on the hot seat watching in Alpharetta, Georgia there. Well, uh, this is pretty tough to imagine for me, too. So I put this at an 8.5 on the boldness scale. Michigan's got a very workable schedule this year. What are they made of? Anytime we're talking about an expectation for a team in a given year, we want to know what they are made of the past four recruiting classes. Top 15. Michigan has finished top 15 recruiting rankings in the past four classes, so it's a very solid nucleus of talent. As I said, very workable schedule here. Very workable. In fact, they should absolutely be undefeated entering October. So what are we asking them to do? If you're listening on podcast, here's what we're asking them to do. If we think they're going to lose four or more games, certainly we think they have to lose against Penn State and probably Michigan State and Ohio State. I think those are non-negotiable. they got to lose all those. Then they got to lose at least two of Maryland, at Iowa, at Indiana, Nebraska. I just don't think that's going to happen. They're not breaking in new quarterbacks up there. They're breaking in new coordinators. But it's like we said the other night. They don't start with a challenging slate. They get to break themselves in. So whatever they will be, they already are by the time they're really truly challenged for the first time in the season. I don't think this is happening. I, I talked to a good buddy the other day who's a diehard Michigan fan. He said, I got to be real with you. I'd be disappointed if they were 9-3. and three. Uh, That would be a bad year considering the schedule. They're over under win total at Caesars right now is nine and a half. So, yeah. I, and the other part of this is they finish with eight wins or less and he's on the hot seat again. I just don't see it happening. I do not see it happening. So I put that in an eight and a half, maybe even higher than that. Uh, this next one is, is equally as saucy, but half of it can come true. So let's talk about Oklahoma. In year one, under the new staff, Oklahoma football will have both a higher ranked offense and a higher ranked defense than they had a year ago. I've got good news and bad news here. So I'm putting this at an eight on the boldness scale. The good news is this should be doable defensively. Brent Venables is your head coach now, so you automatically expect good things defensively. They were 109th last year in the country in points per game given up. You know they were battered in the secondary, had a lot of injury back there. Uh, So that was well documented. That's the good news, though. The bad news is how are they going to pull this off offensively exactly? They were first in the red zone last year, best red zone team in the country. They were eighth offensively in points per game. We lose Caleb Williams. We do get Dylan Gabriel. We're going to talk about him later in the show. It's not like we're, we're poor manning Oklahoma here, but we have to improve offensively from being eighth in the country last year in points per game without Jaden Hazelwood, without Mario Williams. We lost a tight end. We lost our quarterback. Uh, and that's not it. That's not an exhaustive list. I do not see improvement offensively. Defensively, you can pull that off. Offensively, which is the stipulation here, I don't think that's happening. So Oklahoma better on both sides? That's a little steep even for me. I'm going to go eight on the boldness scale. The next one is one of my favorite that we've done so far. Nebraska. We highlighted, they gave us three here. We highlighted the middle one. Nebraska starts the season 6-0, and headed into the Purdue game. Now, a lot of you know Nebraska finished with a 3-9 and nine record last year. So this sounds very bold, doesn't it? You know what it is to me? It's about a 6 on the boldness scale and no more. Why is that? Well, let me explain to you how close this is to happening. If we just went by point spreads, let me tell you how close this is to happening. One upset away. Nebraska figures to be favored in five of their first six games. And look at week four, if you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening on podcast. Oklahoma comes in there, and that's the fourth game of the season, and that is September 17th, and if they can pull that off, you figure Oklahoma, if they're going to be vulnerable, this would be the year, if they pull that off, they'll be favored against Northwestern, North Dakota, Georgia Southern, Indiana, at Rutgers, this could really happen, they could go to Purdue 6-0, and now, as much as I could see that happening, I think we all have to pour a huge bucket of cold water on this and remind ourselves that Scott Frost is entering his fifth year at Nebraska, and so far those records have sounded a little something like this. Four and eight, five and seven, three and five, COVID year, three and nine. Their over-under win total is seven and a half this year. 
So big things are expected. Clearly, a career year is expected from the odds makers. Part of that is due to, well, a lot of portal movement. Second most portal movement in college football behind USC. Part of that is due to Casey Thompson being quarterback there. Part of that is due to how many close losses they had last year. And part of it's just due to the fact that they've got a workable schedule. So, yeah, they could be 6-0. and And also, Colin, could you throw their schedule back up for a second right quick? Because if you look at the conference games that they play to open the season, they've got Northwestern, they've got Indiana, and at Rutgers. Those are the three Big Ten games they play before the Purdue game. Those are the three lowest over-under win total teams in the conference. So if I were to construct this schedule, I could not have constructed it any more favorably. You're only a, you finished three and nine last year, and you're only a dog once before you play a game mid-October? That's there. That's there for the taking. All right, last one here. Uh, we got to do the acronym instead of the name of the school for reasons that have been noted on this show before. Brigham Young is going to embarrass the Pac-12 again with wins at Oregon and at Stanford. I call this a seven on the boldness scale. Now, where are these games? Well, uh, Oregon is early. They play them week three in Eugene. They play at Stanford the last week of the regular season. What do you know about Brigham Young? Probably not a whole lot. Well, we told you the other night, and this is a stat that Bears repeating, keeping in mind when you're going to the betting window, one of 19 teams in Power 5 that return a head coach, both coordinators, and a quarterback. They are second in the country in overall returning production. They return 88% of their production last year, which we value as a stat much more than number of returning starters. How much production do you return? 88% of what was a really good team last year returns production-wise this year. This is a really good team. Uh, they're they're, they're going to be better than most teams that Oregon plays in the Pac-12. Uh, so that game at Oregon Week 3, that's no gimme at all. And certainly, they'd be favored right now if they played Stanford. Stanford's over-under win total is 4.5. Now, Oregon is up there around the favorites to win the Pac-12 championship. They're at 9. Uh, this could happen. In fact, if they beat Oregon in Week 3, they're probably on the national radar. So I gave this a 6. That's a tough game, Week 3, but it's early in the year. New staff at Oregon. Uh, it's going to be one of the most physical challenges they have all year. So I gave that a six. I don't know. That's not any bolder than a six to me. And if Brigham Young does that, then it totally flips the coin because you know you and I have talked about how big it would be if Oregon were to upset Georgia and Utah beats Florida in week one. Well, the other side of that is you're going to let Brigham Young come out there and slap you around again as a conference? Don't let that happen. It's not a good look for anyone except the folks in Provo, of course, which is a place I still haven't been able to go to see a game yet. Uh, but those are Bold Predictions version 11.0. As always, I will be active in the comments. They're watching us not in Marietta, Georgia, although they probably are, but in Marietta, California. Thank you for tuning in. Hattiesburg, Mississippi is watching. Vandalia, Missouri is watching. And our friends in Munich, Germany are watching. We had a few German shout-outs to give, so that's one of them. We've got them lined up. Uh, the transfer portal is the biggest story in college football. It's our most popular topic on the show. And we have to talk about some things now that the portal player rankings for this cycle are finalized. You can find them over on 247sports.com. But I want you to pay attention to some things. The first thing is, out of the top 25, there are six quarterbacks in those rankings. Also, USC and Ole Miss in the team rankings are number one and number two. If you had to guess without looking, by the way, how many kids out of the transfer portal do you think they have combined to take? Southern Cal, Ole Miss. The answer is 34 combined players added to those rosters out of the transfer portal. Nebraska, just told you a second ago, if you're watching the live show, they are the second most active portal team behind USC. Nebraska has added 16 kids so far this cycle. It's going to shape every conference race. I mean, I'm about to talk about some of this. You will quickly realize what I mean when I say there is no conference race that will avoid being massively shaped by what has happened in the transfer portal. Okay, so quarterback rankings, I want to talk about first and foremost. Caleb Williams is the number one overall player here, goes from Oklahoma to USC. Quinn Ewers is the number two overall player, obviously goes from Ohio State to Texas. The first thing I want to know from you is do you agree with that order? Because I cannot tell you how fervently some people have reached out to me and said, oh, I think Quinn Ewers is best overall player there. But yet, when I'm looking at the process, our guys go through to make those rankings, 
experience is going to matter a whole lot there. So I certainly get how I mean, if you're splitting hairs, I'd give Caleb Williams the nod. And I'm Scott Howe and Quinn Ewers. I'd give Caleb Williams the nod. But think about the difference potentially that could be made here. I said the other day, and I got mocked for it over on the Peristyle. That's the USC message board here. I've got a very, very love-hate relationship with those folks. I love them. They hate me. That's how that works. I said, you know, USC could finish as a five-loss team, or they could win the Pac-12 championship. <laughs> and they rightfully called me out for not making a bold prediction. But the whole point was I was making the least bold statement ever. Having a cat like Caleb Williams walk in the door gives such potential volatility to your win-loss scenarios. When August comes around on this show, we take the biggest teams in the country and we do best, worst, most likely record scenarios. Well, with USC, the gap could be like five or six games. And I hate to do it that way, but that's quite literally what we're looking at out there. They could win the Pac-12. They could go to the playoff. They could have multiple games where you look and say, what if? And they lose four games. The same thing could be said for Texas. Like Caleb Williams goes to USC. Quinn Ewers goes to Texas. My point is, when you mention USC and Texas this year, I don't care if you're, I mean, uh, let's just pick someone random. I don't care if you're a New Hampshire football fan. You're watching your team first and foremost. But you're checking those teams out. At the very least, those quarterbacks move the needle for you. Now let's get a little bit more specific with positions. There are three, well, there are three of them, but in a much more real sense, there are three wide receivers in the top 10 of the player rankings here, and I want to spend a couple of seconds on each one of them. Jordan Addison most recently and, and very, very shrewdly chose the moment in time that Nick Saban and Jimbo Fisher went at each other to announce, I'm leaving Pitt, I'm going to USC. A lot of you knew it was going to happen for like a month, but I'm doing it while that big dust cloud down south is present. And he did it, and he's there now. This is the number three overall player in the overall 24-7 sports transfer portal player rankings. That is the Bolitnikoff Award winner for best receiver in the country last year. I think that when you look at how their wide receiver room is going to stack up at USC, to get a true number one threat in there, is so, so important because they're going to have a lot of guys that can now naturally fall into place because a guy like Jordan Addison walked in the room. I also look at Mario Williams, who is also going to Southern Cal at number nine. He's, he was a second leading receiver at Oklahoma as a true freshman last year. Goes out there with Lincoln Riley. There's not much guessing about what kind of impact he's going to make. But Jermaine Burton at number 10 there, that's one of the more intriguing moves to me because that's a wide receiver who probably has first-round raw physical ability and didn't realize it at Georgia just because it wasn't the system they were playing in. They're not doing anything wrong. They just won a national championship. But for Jermaine Burton, this is, this is the Jamison Williams guy this year. I'm not comparing the two players. I'm saying if you're looking for, for a guy to come from relative national obscurity to just popping off and going for 1,000, 1,500 yards, he's the guy who gives himself that opportunity. If he's healthy... He is that kind of guy. He is a number one receiver type, especially if you got Bryce Young throwing you the ball. Running back is another position to pay close attention to here. So the order breaks down like this. There are two running backs in the top 10 of the final player rankings. Jameer Gibbs from Georgia Tech to Alabama. I've told you I thought he was the best player in the Atlantic Coast Conference last year. Total package. He is a big time and dynamic receiving threat out of the backfield. And to give you an idea of how much Alabama lacked that last year, uh, Brian Robinson had 296 receiving yards. You go back to the year before, they won the national championship. They played less games. Najee Harris had like twice that many. And he was playing on a team with the Heisman Trophy winner at wide receiver. So they need a more dynamic presence back there. I thought Jason McClellan would have been that for them before he got hurt last year. Could very well be that again this year. But Jameer Gibbs is there at fourth. Check out number eight, Zach Evans. Because that's a guy I'm sky high on. Now I just told you how high I am on Gibbs which should tell you something when I inform you, I think Zach Evans may end up being the best tailback in the SEC West this year, transfer portal or not. He fits the same description. He is also very, very versatile, Swiss Army knife kind of guy. He is, he's very dynamic, got very good vision, very physical, has the ability to be a total game breaker at Ole Miss, especially when you consider how many opportunities he's gonna get. Just think about the size of the opportunity in front of Zach Evans what he was coming out of high school, and what he now could be fully realized in terms of potential at Ole Miss. Some other things 
to look for here, just outside the top 10, guys that I will be looking for to make an instant impact. Drew Sanders, who transferred away from Bama, he's gone to Arkansas. One thing to keep in mind, he was an outside linebacker at Alabama. They're going to move him inside at Arkansas. He's going to be an every down guy for them. Huge pickup, one of the biggest pickups that, because he's not an offensive guy, didn't make the national headlines, but it, I can assure you it made local headlines there. Uh, no character concern. He was just on a loaded situation at Alabama and went to Arkansas. So keep an eye on him. Spencer Rattler, of course, at the quarterback position for South Carolina. Uh, this is as big a program impact, remember, out of the portal as we had. That was a massive splash because that was very unforeseen. No one knew that was coming. And all of a sudden, boom, him. Austin Stogner also went with him, the tight end from Oklahoma. So Spencer Rattler is, is going to be a very, very integral part of South Carolina this year. And then the side note for them, since they're still an up-and-coming staff, an up-and-coming program, is if they overachieve again this year, it really signifies that, okay, we've got some staying power. And look at what we just did. We just brought a quarterback in, and look what we did for him. What could we do for you? You can very easily sense how that messaging would work in recruiting. Go back to Texas for a second. There's been a lot of talk about how many kids they've brought in and how much of their roster can they overturn. Isaiah Nayer is a wide receiver that played at Wyoming that you probably didn't know a lot about, that you will know a lot about this year. Isaiah Nayer is one of the most important players Texas has brought in. He'll be one of the most important players on their team this year. I know there's been a lot of talk about Ajay Hall. There's been a lot of talk about uh, Jaleel Billingsley. I would put much more faith right now in Isaiah Nair. I'm just, I think they've been a lot more pleased with what they've gotten from him on and off the field so far relative to the other two names I just mentioned. I'll leave that at that. Uh, also, Dylan Gabriel at Oklahoma. We've mentioned him earlier. Dylan Gabriel is kind of like the Oklahoma version of what Spencer Rattler is at South Carolina. They are guys that have been, they've been brought in. They will immediately start, so the opportunity is there for them, and they will totally determine those teams' respective fates this year. And Dylan Gabriel is a guy who went to UCLA for like 15 minutes before he redirects his final destination to Oklahoma. There is so much to look at here. I would strongly encourage you, because of how much this is part of the fabric of the sport now and moving forward, if you don't know the transfer portal, you don't know college football right now. So don't be taken by surprise. Don't be the guy or girl who's sitting there in week three saying, wait, I thought that guy played for Georgia. Don't be that person. This is why we don't have an off-season around here. 247sports.com, or you can just replay this segment over and over again. There is, there's a lot of meat on the bone in these transfer portal rankings, both the team rankings and the player rankings. I would highly encourage you to be well-versed on this. Certainly, if you plan on betting any of your money on this sport, you better know. You better know. Okay, we got a couple of really good questions here. Ah, really good questions. <sighs> Where do we start? You know, let's start with the game day question. A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of you know what this is about, and a lot of you don't know what this is about. From Calhoun, Georgia, Charlie asked me to tell the story about how we got the show banned from college game day. As someone who played a role, Charlie says, it makes me proud. Hashtag producer Jesse isn't real. I can only vouch for one of these things totally, and that is, yeah, we kind of sort of accidentally got the show banned from college game day. Here's what I need to tell you first and foremost. And if you're watching on YouTube, which I highly advise you to do, you are seeing some of the highlights. I am a traditionalist. I grew up watching College Game Day. I appreciate the fabric of this sport. I appreciate the legacy aspects of this sport. I'm not some revolutionary. I'm not a counterculture guy. So the last thing on this planet I have ever tried to do is take an institution like College Game Day and wreck it. But at the same time, this is America, and I cannot control what our audience does. And so here was the reel. As you know, Famously, we have a $0 marketing budget on this show. So I may have, once upon a time, at some point last August, whispered into this microphone, you know, it'd be cool if we got a, if we got a late kick sign on college game day. Notice, singular, a late kick sign. That's all I was going for. If we could just get our brand visible there once. Hey, we've paid for our entire year's worth of a marketing budget. Well... I don't know that I've ever asked our audience to do something that they didn't tenfold over deliver on. Uh, this was more like a 100 fold over deliverance. So there we sit in Charlotte, North Carolina, week one. Game day was there. It was Georgia, Clemson, and 
There we are. We got, we got a couple of pay stay signs. We got some late kick signs on the broadcast. I'm so happy. All's well that ends well. And I even took one of these bad boys, a chalice of supremacy. More on this in a second. And I promised one of these to anyone who got our logo on College Game Day. And you can't see it, but engraved on these. Actually, maybe if I turn it that way. Yeah, there's the Pate State logo. Well, here was the problem. I expected to have to give away one of those. We had like nine the first week. And so then, week two, I'm in Ames, Iowa for Iowa versus Iowa State. College Game Day is in Ames, Iowa for Iowa, Iowa State. Ashton Kutcher is the guest celebrity picker. But when I had screenshots sent to in my hotel room as I was packing up and headed to the stadium, it wasn't of Ashton Kutcher. It was of one of you with a big, fat poster board with a late kick right over his right shoulder, TV left, stage left, and I cannot tell you how many of you tagged me in that. And that wasn't the only one there that day. Then the next week, where were they? They were at Auburn, Penn State. So were we. We just... I, I view it as game day followed us early in the season. You can also say we follow game day. Several of you in State College showed out. This is when the poster patrol started to take notice, I've been told since. And so we got ourselves some more recognition and, and the chali. I mean, this was going to be a singular thing. I was going to give away a chalice of supremacy. All of a sudden, we're racking up chali of supremacy, which, of course, is the plural of chalice. And boy... The price tag. We may have a $0 marketing budget. The Chalai budget went through the roof after week four of college game day. Week five, they were in Chicago for Notre Dame, Wisconsin. I think we got a couple on air then. But week six is when it went down. So week six, it's Arkansas at Georgia. And game day is in Athens. And so were you. And I think it, had, it felt like millions. It easily was dozens of game day signs that were on air. And I'm, well, I'm, I'm over the moon. You know, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking on one hand, mm, man, it's kind of a little bit ridiculous. But on the other hand, hey, look, Payne State, hey, that's my face on that poster. Well, then about 11 a.m., the eye josh lights up like a Christmas tree, kind of like it is right now, as a matter of fact, from, from disrespectful friends who know I'm on air. And uh, that morning, what it was was a bunch of Twitter and Instagram DMs from you guys and you were irate, bunch of all caps DMs that morning. And what you were telling me was, my sign just got taken. My poster just got taken. Hey, my entire display just got taken. And then came the creme de la creme, and I don't have a picture of this, but one of you <laughs> were able to get a snapshot of this huge pile of late kick posters that the poster patrol at College Game Day, security in your world, uh, came and took, and they just, they just made a little mountain of them. And then one of you was so bold as to sneak behind the barrier and get your poster back and took a picture of you with your once confiscated poster. And this was the day that we were informed in no uncertain terms that the late kick and everything associated with it had been banned on college game day and any other ESPN property. So I thought to myself, self, we've already gotten what we wanted out of this. What should we do? So director Colin and I, we convened the next morning when I got back in town from wherever I had been, and we decided, you know what, let's reach out, let's be adults about this, let's reach across the aisle, and let's just, let's call a spade a spade, let's just issue a truce as long as they'll acknowledge us. I knew in my heart of hearts that they cannot acknowledge us, that would be foolish on their part. But friend of the program, Kirk Herbstreet, did reach out to us at the 11th hour, and he did acknowledge us, and he said, hey, love what you're doing. What in the world's happening? I didn't know anything about this. And so we called the dogs off for now. And I cannot control, like I said, what our audience does this year. I will say maybe we'll incentivize some other kind of behavior so that we don't, we don't get banned from another show. We didn't even mess with Big Noon Kickoff, so it was just a college game day thing. But yeah, we got banned from college game day. Now, I grew up watching college game day, so if you ever told little JP that he was going to be banned from college game day, I would have cried. I can't tell you I didn't cry this past year when we got banned, but maybe a tear of joy this time around. So that's the story of how you, more so than I, got us banned from college game day. Are you ashamed? I'm not either. Moving on here. Last question. Thank you so much for being tuned in. Uh, the over-under for the time to get off air tonight is uh, 7.55. 
I think we can hit this under. Alan hit us up. Why do so many five-star recruits end up being busts? Podcast listener from College Dale, Tennessee, home of Little Debbie. Is that true? It's got to be. Why would he have said it if it's not? Uh, so shout out to College Dale, Tennessee and Little Debbie. Love both of you equally. What do we mean by recruiting bust? So I just took a very serious tone because this is a very serious um, topic for me. I get very aggravated about it. When people say bust, recruiting bust, what, is, what does it mean? We cannot simply mean any player who was rated five stars that didn't go on to be a first round draft pick. We've got to make it more complex than that. Because there are so many factors that go into play that can't be taken into a star ranking. So the proper way to interpret a star ranking, I think, is what is the most bastardized portion of this whole process. Some people look at a star ranking and they think, okay, 24-7 sports is saying that kid's a guaranteed first-round draft pick, and if they're wrong, that means that it's a bust. That's not what a star ranking is. That's never what it's been. What it is is a portion If we go back to the pie, I have to dumb it down to the pie all the time. If we go back to the pie, then a star ranking is a slice. It's a big slice. I mean, it's basically a raw talent metric, but it's a slice of the pie that, if baked fully, makes a complete college football player. No one in our rankings council meetings, which I formerly have sat in on, no one's there claiming that a star ranking is the end-all, be-all. It's an absolute true North Star in terms of guidance on what a player is going to be. It is guidance, but it's not total in nature because that's not everything that goes into making a college football player. How are you going to take a guy's mental disposition into account when giving him a star rating? How are you supposed to know how frequently he's going to go to class? How are you supposed to know if he's going to get in trouble and and his girlfriend's going to have all kinds of drama with him in his sophomore year and he's just mentally going to be checked out? How would you ever know that watching him play at modern day high school down there in Southern California? You wouldn't is the answer. So here's the best way I can explain it to you. A lot of you are going on vacation this time of year. Verbo Citrus Bowl tied into college football. So maybe you're on Verbo and maybe you're, you're getting a little rental property. And you got a nice condo there on the beach and everyone's all excited and ready. But let me ask you, does a beachfront, well, what would it be, a beachfront? Yeah. Does a beachfront condo guarantee a good vacation? The answer is no. Many of you have experienced this before. You got the best accommodations you could possibly have. But you got family drama, and you got a cousin who wasn't invited and shouldn't be there to begin with that wrecks the entire thing. Or, you know, maybe your credit card gets declined because your identity has been stolen. Well, how stupid would it be to stand on the beach and throw rocks at the condo? It's not the condo's fault. The condo is just the condo. It's just there. And it's the same way in recruiting. If a five-star kid goes to college and washes out for reasons that involve neck up portions of the game. Uh, He he doesn't grasp the playbook or mentally he's checked out because he has family issues back home. That has nothing to do with a star rating. So if he doesn't pan out, you don't look at that kid, or at least I don't, in good conscience and say, boy, the recruiting service is really whiffed on him. Because here's normally what you're saying. If a five-star kid doesn't pan out, if you go to his offer list, you see Alabama, Ohio State, (laughs) Georgia, Clemson. So was it an Alabama, Georgia, Clemson, Ohio State bust? Because they apparently evaluated him to the point where every one of them thought he's good enough to be a Buckeye. He's good enough to be a Clemson Tiger. He's good enough to play for Oklahoma or Alabama. The answer is they weren't all wrong about their evaluation. It's just there are certain things that evaluations cannot possibly take into account. And that's why the star ranking, even as I sit here in a 24-7 sports studio, should not be the end-all be-all when you're rating a player. That's just the closest thing you can get in this world. Unless you have psychic abilities, which I don't think any of our guys have. At least they haven't told me. I've read all their bios. So I don't think about recruiting busts the same. Now, if a guy gets on campus and he doesn't have it physically, if you watch him and he just looks like he's running a gear slower than everyone else, then you can start talking about recruiting busts. You know, if a guy is too light in the britches his junior year as an offensive tackle and he was a five-star coming out of high school, that could be a recruiting bust. But man, like if a guy's grandmother gets a terminal illness and he's 3,000 miles away and he's just, he just, he's a family kid and he's distracted by what's going on at home in the real world and he never really is fully invested in college football, that's not a recruiting bust. That's just life. That stuff happens. I'll tell you what's happening with the show there. We're, um, we're done for the evening. 
but we are certainly not done for the, for the season. Uh, we have just been cranking out content because you guys have been gobbling it up. Our numbers are insane. Uh, so insane. I tell you that every time, but it's true every time. So thank you. All we ask, the only thing we ask is subscribe. We're getting ever closer to 100,000 subs on the YouTube channel. Subscribe, get us to 100K, and this chalice of supremacy pales in comparison to what we'll be able to do on this show. Also, I, I mentioned that I was going to make an announcement. Those of you who did get your signs on game day, and I did not get you your chalai yet, it's coming. Uh, supply chain rectified, finally, at least in terms of the chalai. So got a fresh batch in, probably going to head over to FedEx tomorrow and get those sent out. So if you haven't already gotten yours, I know it's been delayed. It's not my fault. I just want the credit. I don't want the blame. We're going to get those sent out to you uh, end of this week. So tomorrow, in other words. Thank you so much for watching. For producer Jesse, for director Colin, I'm Josh Pate. Have yourselves a great rest of your evening, and God bless.